I'm here to talk to you about my work, but also about a journey. So normally when I would present, I would present probably a big range of furniture and accessories and you know, all the things that maybe you might have seen a few bits and pieces of. But I'm here to tell a different story today. Um, one that I've only told, this will be the first time I've told it. And of course, it's about my studio. And as the introduction said, that's been recently relaunched as Leia, so no longer under my name. And I want to sort of bring you into the reasons why I've done that. Uh, my view on the design industry and a very particular part of the design industry. And really take you on a very kind of objective journey. So I'm quite pragmatic, I'm quite a numbers person, I'm quite analytical. So I'd like to sort of get you inside my head and give you my view on design. And I want it to be reflective as well. So I've, I've reflected on what I've been doing for the last five or six years. And that's why I've made some changes recently. That's why we've taken on different types of work. But I'll also sort of bring you along the way and show you some of the stuff we've done in the last five years. So this is going to be a bit of a numbers game. And I'm just going to kind of give you some context of you know, anybody that doesn't know my work or who I am. And I graduated more or less 10 years ago. So this summer it will be 10 years ago from Loughborough University in a big class of 150. And despite popular belief, I didn't start my studio from university. I then worked for a big organization. I was just one of a big team, predominantly doing things like medical products and transport and things like that. And I would highly recommend it as well, not to start your studio immediately, but go into one of these organizations. And, and then a few years later, I moved to London, and I worked for the of TV frame, of TV sketching fame, Seymour Powell, and did much more consumer goods and things like that. And the team was getting a little smaller, but still quite a big design studio. And this kept this kind of trend of teams getting smaller continued. And then I worked for Tangerine for about a year, Jonathan Ive fame. And again, consumer goods and things like that. And along this journey and along this path, I discovered uh, Milan Furniture Fair. And I'm sure lots of people have been there, read about it, write magazines about it, and kind of got this bug. I realized that you could express yourself through generally a chair, and put your name to it. And I thought this was something appealing to me and something I wanted to explore. So I started my studio in 2010, so more or less five years ago, five years ago last October. And in order to start my studio, one of the things I wanted to do in this talk is talk about, you know, lots of people have talked about their work, and what I wanted to talk about because of the, the position in my career is how you start a studio. And I made, um, over the three years of working for these companies, I made about 10 prototypes, chairs, lamps, ceramics, some pretty bad stuff, I'm being completely honest. You can look it up and it's pretty awful. And I realized, I look back on this and I realized this was about 40,000 pounds that I invested in this. Not something I was aware of during the time, but exhibiting at things like um, LDF, London Design Festival, and making all of these things ended up costing me about this. And maybe not a huge number, but certainly for somebody just taking it off their wage as a, a starting designer, it was quite a lot of money. Um, and that allowed me to found my studio under my name, um, as I'm sure you know. And on the first five years of practice, grew from a very shoebox two meters by about seven meters, super tiny to a slightly less tiny, but still very modest studio. And again, despite popular belief, it's not a big studio. It was really, really small until very recently. I just want to give lots of context here about sort of, you know, what happens in the industry when you start a studio. You obviously get a lot of designers applying to work with you. But as a small studio, you can only take so many. So we were a very small team. For nearly five years, we were three or four people. Um, and people are often surprised by that. We did quite a lot of work. But actually, that's a reflection on the industry and the commercial realities of the design industry, particularly around this kind of bubble that is sort of Milan and furniture and signature designers, which again, I'll come on to in a minute. And just again, a bit more context, but we had nearly 4,000 interns apply to us over this time, and we like to try and take interns. We have a program, we do pay them, and we took about 30 over that five-year period, and we try and employ as well. So just a bit of context in order to understand how I set up a studio, the decisions that I made at that time, and the reasons um, why. And this is very numbers. This is like a, like a numbers game, this whole presentation. And it's a little bit the way I think. So that five years, we work about 10 hour days. It's about 11,385 hours in that five years. Our model at the time was basically about 40% 
concept pitches, so free pitching, the taboo that nobody likes to talk about, but more or less everybody does. And particularly in the industry I'm talking about, it's almost encouraged to free pitch. It's almost like they're giving you freedom to do whatever you like, but they're not going to pay you for that privilege because you're an artist. We also did 60% of commission work, but it's really this 40% I want to focus on. And over that five years, it's about four and a half thousand hours of free pitching. No money, developing ideas, having meetings, talking about those ideas with people, but again, not really about anything commercial. So I want to show you what that looked like for me. Um, and I've never really talked about this, and I don't think many designers talk about this, but I don't think enough designers do. Because I think there's a lot of things that are unsaid in the design industry that need to be talked about. Over that period, I pitched about, and the small team pitched, nearly 25 designs a year. So it mounts up to about 128 concepts a year. And when we talked to companies, only about 65 of those concepts were taken to prototype. So that might be a sketch, a model, we might make a prototype, but then they would take it forward from that point. So about 65 or 128. And then of those 65, um, 52 were launched at fairs. So whether it's Milan or Stockholm or New York or wherever it might be, I'm sure many designers have done the same kind of thing. But I started to think about, again, about the numbers game. So 48 of those were only launched on the market. And then if you start comparing that to the 128 that we pitched, you start to think about, what are we doing? So only 37.5% of things were going through. And these weren't commissioned jobs. They were, these were free pitches. And maybe you could criticize us for playing this game. But it is a game that exists in this particular industry, which is promoted. And that if you want to be part of it, you have to kind of play it. So I started thinking about um, that, that percentage. But before I, I, I talk about why I'm bringing this up and, and go on to some work, I want to give you a really quick snapshot of five years, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it kind of sounded like, um, and the intensity of it. And basically, that, that kind of thing. Thanks. And it was kind of that kind of prodigy drum and bass intensity of running around, making prototypes, pitching them to companies, hoping they go through. You know, that, that's kind of emblematic of what I feel like we went through in that time. So back to the, back to the point. So that is about you know, 4,000, you know, whatever hours uh, across those five years. That breaks down to about 910 per year, if you want to get really into detail. That also is 449 hours of unsuccessful pitches. I talked about, you know, so there were some of the things that went through. That's the amount of hours that were spent on things that didn't. So that started making me think, well, what are we doing with this time? Can't we use that time a little better? And I want to put this in context. So it's hopefully this won't come off completely as Milan Design Week bashing, because it's not supposed to. But in this week, and I only use it as an example because it's the most popular of all of these weeks, 1,323 of these companies launch Products. And this is just at the fairground. And if each of these companies launch five products, which often they launch 20, 25, some of them are much more conservative, but anybody that's trawled the, the kind of up and down of, of Fiera will know how many new things that you see. That actually equates to 6,615 new products a year that are essentially chairs, lamps, pieces of ceramic, and things like that. And then if you kind of scale that up again, for five years, that's 33,000 new products in an area where you start questioning why are there so many more things being generated. The technology isn't moving that quickly. Things haven't really changed in the industry since the mid-century, and, and people like the Eames uh, were doing some interesting things. You know, there's some new materials, there's some new techniques, but largely it's been pretty unchanged. Um, and I looked at what we were doing for our work, and, and the amount 
of impact we could create and the percentage of that. And as you can see, it's barely a percent of that. And of course, as a designer, you hope that that percent is near the top of the things that are interesting. But I think the biggest question that got me was, was about the, the, the problems that we were trying to solve. As industrial designers, as any designer, we've got a responsibility to solve problems, to make things better, to make things healthier and happier, as the kind of intro talked about. And, you know, we solved the problem of sitting a long time ago. So I kind of thought to myself, why are we trying to solve that problem anymore? Because it's been done to death. And it's not just that question of why another chair. We do need a good chair. But we don't need 33,000 chairs over five years. So I started thinking, how can we use that time better? So this is a little bit kind of business model-y, but I kind of thought it would be interesting to come from this at a different angle. So those 449 hours, the things that didn't go through, the things we weren't being paid for, but this pitch game, the free pitch game that we were involved with, that equates to 44 days a year. What if we could use those 44 days for something else? What if we could give back? What if we could use the skills in the studio that we've been building up to do things that are more relevant, that help people, that move things forward, help communication, help living conditions, etc.? We also flipped the model of the studio. So we did much more consultation work um, and, of course, a little bit of furniture work. We're still doing a little bit of that. And that works out to be, you know, the number I really want to think about here is the 20%. And one of the reasons I'm talking about this and it's one of my hopes is that there are some other studios that will hear this, that are maybe here, that, that are in the simulcast, or maybe will listen to it on the website, and they'll go, well, we must have a 20% that we can use for something that's better. I mean, there are many studios that can do it, and particularly in the industry that I've been working on. Um, so I founded Leia. I founded Leia um, six months ago. So I founded it at London Design Festival, although we've been working in the background to make this happen over the last year and a half. Or so. And over that time, just again to give some context before I talk about some of that giving back, some of that 20% I think everybody can probably spare, particularly as a designer um, in the audience. You know, we also doubled in size. So you know, if it wasn't the giving back that you wanted to do, there are more commercial, interesting things to be able to sort of flip the model and come, take a step away from having an ego, I suppose. Putting yourself ahead of the business and, and having your name above the door. We also quadrupled in size. And this is only in six months, and we still have interns we bring in. But it's this I want to talk about. It's really, why are there so many designers that have their name above the door that are doing signature design styles? And everybody needs style. We need different style, and it's a very broad church. And of course, everything is welcome, and, and it's interesting to contrast and complement all of those sort of things. But I want to take a step back, a more democratic platform, represent the team that works for us, not just me, and then to be able to do projects that aren't about my agenda. So it's not about my exploration of materials or my personal aesthetic or a radius I like or anything like that, which is often common in this industry. It's about you know, using design as a powerful tool for change. And we see the world in layers. So we see the, the world in layers of problems, layers of issues, layers of things to solve, and layers of value. So hence, we named it Layer. So what I want to do is pose four questions. These were four questions that we either posed uh, proposed to some companies, or we were proposed the questions. But they form the basis of four projects I would like to talk about. So the first one is, how can we be more charitable? Everybody probably thinks it, and normally it's, it's, it's what's the vehicle to enable us to be more charitable. So the first project I'd like to talk about is a project that we did in collaboration with Maggie's Cancer Charity. It's a UK charity, UK char ch cancer charity, and one of the things they do really well is they commission, and I'm sure about you, you know about this organization, but they, they commission famous architects like a Frank Gehry or a Norman Foster, or in this case, this is a facility in London by Richard Rogers. And they create environments for people to live more healthily, more happily, um, during a very difficult period in their life, what, whether they're either caring for somebody with cancer or they're going through the terrible disease that is cancer. So they have a very unique business model where they use design, or in this instance, architecture, to really help you know, people in, uh, going through a very difficult period. So they, they came to us last year and said, we've got a new, new site that's being built. I think it's a new Foster's one. Um, would you design a chair for us? And um, recalling some of the numbers that I sort of brought up here, I sort of said to them, well, actually, I think probably there's enough nice chairs on the market. You could choose one of ours if you want, but if not, there's probably um, 6,000 or so that are being launched in Milan this year. And I was quite frank with them 
Um, and I think they appreciated it because I think they've gone to lots of designers and they, you know, how much does a chair help the charity? You can get a comfortable chair and then, you know, where, what else do you do to really build value into that object? So I, I sort of talked to them about this. There are 185,000 charities in the UK alone. And then if you think about Maggie's in that context, that one charity, and then if you scale up that thinking, there are, and this is an exponential number that's getting greater and greater, and we all know the criticism around charities at the moment, but there are 1.2 million in the world. And again, Maggie's is a tiny little speck that you know, barely kind of registers on a global stage. And so we talked about, to them about an issue. Um, they use design in their business already. How can we use it a bit more thoroughly through their business? And so we framed a problem for them. So hopefully that illustrates something. Um, you know, that object, that, that charity collection box, is often the first point of contact for anybody with a charity. And before I talk about this too much, what's something I'm going to do throughout this talk is we are industrial designers, we design hardware, and I want to put some things in your hands. So I'm going to hand a few things out during this, so, so kind of bear with me. And if you sort of interact with them, but not for too much time, and sort of pass them around and kind of get an experience for them. So I'm going to hand out three of these um, boxes. And really, just to get some things in your hand, to have more of a visceral kind of memory. Um, it's OK. No, I'll do it. It's fine. fine. Yeah, yeah, it's OK. Take a, take a load off. Um, so we'll start one here and just kind of pass, pass them back through the audience. And if the moment takes you where you'd even like to donate some money to the charity, then it all goes to a good, good cause and definitely not to my beer money at the end of the festival. It will go directly to Maggie's. And really, I just want you to think about the object as you're passing it around and I'm talking about it. So, you know, we went on the design process to create something memorable, identifiable, meaningful, you know, all these words you normally use in a design project. And we went through the process of making models and trying to find something that was identifiable, um, something that was rich, something that essentially took this object from disappearing between the chubba chubs and the chewing gum, and made it stand out and be something people recognized, something that people were engaged with, and essentially to raise more money for the charity. So some of these were some of the models, the one on the left-hand side. You know, I remember a designer in the studio trying to roll coins around the top of the thing and only realizing about a week later that you pick this thing up, and they don't roll anymore, obviously. Um, and we sort of came to this point where we were talking about a gesture. A gesture which was about humility, that was a humble, that was grateful. And you know, we all know that when you walk along the street of somebody shaking one of these things and demanding that you donate to it. And this was more about an object through its semantics, through its form, through its shape, through its function, through its tactility that you would want to donate to. So it had this bow, this humble gratitude saying thank you for donating. And really just from a, a formal expression, just something that people would think it was almost human. If it's a very human cause, why can't the object represent that? And to have something that had a great deal of character to it. You know, this is one of the problems. When you see one of these things, um, you know, whether it's in a corner store or news agents or whatever, the roughness around the top and where you're supposed to put this money in is terrible, particularly over time. You can see the sticker is disappearing. You can see it's very, very used and worn. You can see the slot is disappearing. It's hardly saying to you, put your money in. So we wanted to base everything around the slot. So the overall macro language is about this slot, kind of scaling the slot up, having this very gentle curve to the middle, and just really, through a formal expression, encouraging to donate. And the bottom, we took off all the connections and the sticker and where you remove it as a charity and put it on the bottom. So we're cleaning everything out, putting it underneath, and creating much more clarity and something that is much more identifiable. It becomes a solid piece of metal, essentially, once it's full of coins. So again, it needs to be very tactile, ergonomic, and all of these kind of things. But it was this idea of creating a character from something that's much maligned, OEM, off the shelf, from China, 
just colored by most charities, rebranded. Why can't this object be owned by a charity? It's actually never really been done before, which I was amazed by. Um, so Maggie's are the first ones to really take a, an object that is extremely overlooked and elevate it. So you can see the before and after. And this has just gone out into the wild to be tested. And at the moment, the figures coming back is there's an 83% increase in donation to the charity just because they invested a small amount of time, and, and we did the project pro bono, to, to, to really use this tool to raise engagement, to raise more money. Um, so that's the first project I'd like to talk to you about. So the second project is um, for a company called uh, Wave and Image. And this is somewhere between the kind of cons consultation and the giving back idea. Um, and the question we posed was, how can we listen better? Everyone talks about communication, but what about listening? It's normally about talking. So how can we listen better? Um, and we started with a number, like all of these will, and 60 decibels. 60 decibels is the talking level of, of, of anybody at a normal normal rate. And what happens when there's a big group of people, obviously, that sound increases. So I want to talk about NRC. So NRC is a slightly tedious thing to talk about, but is incredibly import important. So this is the noise reduction coefficient. So I'm sure nobody's ever going to talk about that, particularly in the pub or anything like that. But this is what makes the quality of a room enjoyable or not. So the noise reduction coefficient. So we posed um, a problem to these guys that we were working with. So this was an idea that we talked to them about, about improving the quality of being in a room, improving, I'm, I'm, firstly, I'm sorry if anyone's office was in that and it doesn't sound terrible, but generally speaking, these office open plan places do. So we talked to them about trying to find um, a solution that didn't rely on the existing architecture, that wasn't about, Michael, if I could put you in service as well, and I could pass some of these to you. Again, I'd like you to uh, kind of pass these around. There's quite a lot of this stuff. Um, if any other volunteer wants to kind of come to the stage and I can hand these and you can pass them back, that would help me out a lot. Thanks. Cheers. Um, and really, again, I just want you to kind of play with these. If you meet somebody that's got a, a piece that kind of matches around another one, if you could kind of send these to the back, that would be really great. Um, and, you know, for me, a lot of this is about tactility and, you know, the emotional response of really handling something and picking it up. Let's do some of these over here. Thank you very much. Okay. So this is a system that we developed for this company, and it was about modularity. It was about responding to both the context that I talked about, something super responsive and adaptable, going on a journey from for two years between... Um, Australia and China, where the production was, Australia, where the company was, and, and London, and going through this iterative process of trying to find something super modular, adaptable, and responsible. You could easily upgrade it, make it bigger and smaller, but also super low cost. So we developed a toolkit, a kit of parts that essentially you can build any size structure, freestanding, which will divide a space and create a room within a room, particularly acoustically. And this is a simple injection molded, it's a relatively simple injection molded system, extremely low cost, recyclable and recycled. And then the tiles is something I want to focus on a little bit. It has a huge surface area, super open grain, um, so it has a really great noise reduction coefficient. It sound, the sound waves go along and they stop and they don't bounce back. Um, and it's made of hemp. And I want to talk about hemp, and I want to promote hemp in a way actually, not in the way that the US has just legalized it, although this project was picked up by loads of places in the US that wanted to stock this alongside other things. But the power of four, why is hemp so good? So 
Hemp versus trees, just to give you some context. So it only takes four months to grow versus 20 for a tree. It has four times the amount of carbon dioxide absorption. We all know the issues about how much carbon dioxide is being released, which again, I'm going to go on to in a minute. Um, and it produces four times more cellulose fiber. So it's like this super crop. Um, it doesn't cost that much to grow, uh, and it provides a lot. So we wanted to utilize this material and essentially create a framework, a skeletal structure that you could then clad with these um, super sustainable um, pressed components, and then you can build it. So it's completely freestanding. You have a huge kind of interlocking. You can build curves. You can build straight lines. You can build it as small as you like, or to 10, 12, 15, 20 meters, up until five or six meters. So it's a super adaptable solution for what is a big problem that nobody talks about. And then just to round this off and give some context, it's, it's and this is, again, a little bit tedious, but maybe someone will start talking about this after this. But it's, you know, it's 0.92 coefficient. Glass is 0.04, so this is like 92% effective. And then again, so it's available in colors and all of this kind of stuff. One of the projects that was um, alluded to in the introduction, quite a, a journey we went on as a studio. Um, and the question I want to propose is, how can we be more accountable? I think we live in the age of accountability. I think every individual is responsible for what they do. Um, and I think we're expected much more to make smarter decisions in order that the, the, the world that we know it um, doesn't descend into what it's expected to for future generations. And this has got a lot to do with carbon. So that was, a, that was an image of a block of carbon. And we work with a carbon trust who are a business that go into other businesses and tell them how to be more efficient. You know, boring things like supply chains and, and where they're sourcing materials from, what they're making things from, staffing, all of these kind of things. But in order to meet all the legislation that governments are saying that people should meet, and of course, that's a good thing. And that's a very push model. So the government are pushing that kind of legislation onto the companies. So we thought, can we flip that? Can we make a pool model? So this is, this is a number we sort of banded around a lot in the studio, and this is the highest the number's ever been, but no one really knows what it means. So it's 402.52 parts of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's completely intangible. Nobody understands it. Nobody knows how it relates to them as an individual, let alone um, the businesses and things they might buy from. It's a completely um, abstract concept. And obviously, we know it's about pollution. It's, a, it's about how much carbon dioxide is being released. But the numbers are completely, um, we can't relate to them. So we can't do anything in our lives to impact on them. So we developed a project with, as a joint venture with the, the Carbon Trust for um, an ecosystem, an ecosystem of digital and physical things for the ecosystem that we live in. And this was uh, an application. And I'll show you a video in a, in, in a moment. So I won't, I won't go into this too deeply. But it has a visual indication how much carbon your lifestyle is creating. It has a percentage up and down on how well you're doing relative to the previous week or the previous day. And then it has that correlation with a number of how much actual carbon you're costing. So you start to build this equation in your head where you might not look at how much carbon there is, but it's in the periphery, it's in the background, so it's there. So you start being educated what carbon means to your lifestyle. And this system worked on, on a number of things, consumption, food and consumables, um, how much energy you're using in your home, and how you travel. And it broke down very much like a fitness tracker, I guess. But the thing with a fitness tracker is very much about me. And we were interested in turning the me into we. So to try and create a community where we're using similar technology that's being used to track your personal fitness, your personal well, well-being, but now to think about the well-being of the world. So hence, the project is called World Being. And there were various facets of this. It was, it was built into your social media, into your Facebook, to benchmark, to create competition between your peers, between your friends, in order to really make it relevant in your life. It used the APIs from Google to basically say to you, how responsible is my journey decision? Not just how efficient it is. And you know, we're under no illusion. We don't think anybody's going to you know, take a much less efficient journey. They're not going to walk for three hours when they could catch, you know, when they could drive their car for 20 minutes. But it's just about being informed. It's about being empowered. So if you want to make a slightly different decision where you actually trade off a little bit of responsibility for efficiency, then you get that choice to do that. And it had a rewards incentive scheme. So it had a little push-pull model within the program. So it had responsible businesses saying, hey, if you achieve something great, if you use much less carbon, then you can come and dine at our restaurant that uses locally sourced ingredients. Or you can use our carpool service, and so you can travel for less money. So it's that kind of push-pull model. There was a piece of hardware for this model, so a wearable component. And 
The issue when you start talking about carbon and you think about hardware, you're like, why are we producing more hardware? Because we don't really need it if we're talking about carbon. So our dichotomy here was we know that the wearable market is booming and will continue to boom. If you look it up, the amount of billions it's going to generate over the next five, six, ten years is incredible. So it was like, how can we fit this into a model people understand and can consume? So we thought about what we can make it from. So e-waste, the waste from electronic goods is exponential at the moment, as you can imagine. Most of it is recycled, but we can't recycle it quick enough almost. So we wanted to compose the object, the wearable from e-waste. So a, a conglomerate of recycled electronic waste, some parts that can't be recycled to create a new, more responsible piece of electronic goods. It had things like an e-ink screen, but a color e-ink screen only drawing power when it needs to. So it appeared like an LCD with the same values, but was much less demanding on energy usage. Um, so this was the ecosystem we built. So what I want to um, talk to you about is something, again, that the introduction talked about which was the way we uh, started the project. And um, this video is a day in the life of using the project. It's, it's quite a long video. So what I want to do is use this as an opportunity to talk to you about how we configured the project, how we worked with the Carbon Trust, and what happened after we kind of pitched this idea. So this is Emma, who's using it for a day. And, um, I'm sure, as, most, as some of you have probably worked out, not all of this project is completely um, you know, uh, uh, ready to work now. This is a near future project, um, but much nearer than we thought it would be. So this uses a lot of existing technology. It uses algorithms provided by the Carbon Trust, um, and it taps into a lot of resources that are already there. Um, this was one of the reasons we started the project. Um, we knew that it was um, relevant, we launched a um, crowd speaking, or we like to call it crowd shouting, because to talk even louder than speaking, um, to launch just before the climate change conference. Um, and so we launched this on a, on a platform, a um, fairly, fairly young kind of platform, where you don't back a project financially, you back it with your social media clout. So you say, hey, I've got um, 2,000 followers on um, Twitter, and this many friends on Facebook, and I'm gonna say, you know what? On this day, I'm going to talk about it. And if you get enough people talking about it and enough energy behind it, our hope was you'd get traction. So traction from people that could help us make this happen. Um, and so what happened is when this launched, and um, launched to just under a million uh, people, lots of people talked about it. Time picked it up. So Time magazine ran a page on it. Um, and then lots of other media and design media and things like that. But it was that mainstream media, then suddenly something happened. The phone started ringing. So people like Netflix were calling us, um, equity companies were calling us, we got investors on the line, we got technology people saying we can make this happen. And now what we've done is we kind of formed um, a think tank around this. People that have got the money to support it, people that have got the expertise to deliver it, and then we form the connection between that, the design which gels everything together to make it happen. So what's happened now is that we're in beta testing mode, not, not for the whole component, for, but for various aspects of it. Um, and our hope is um, over the next year or two, this is on like a roadmap, um, there will be a simplified version of this to help people understand how much carbon they're causing, um, to try and create um, a better world um, for the next people that are going to be inhabiting it, um, and really to you know, utilize our skills as designers to, to make this happen, and to use now our kind of connected friends that are going to enable us to bring it into the world. So as I talked about before, the, the kind of roadmap that this is on is, is over the next couple of years. Um, so using, it, it basically works your payment system. So every time you pay for something, it goes directly into the app. So there's an algorithm which generates how much carbon is driven by certain types of products from certain parts of the world. There is an element of manual input, like there is in a lot of platforms at the moment. If you use MyFitnessPal and say how much calories you're eating, um, and it uses things like real-time payment um, with people like Moven. Um, and it talks in the home, it has the kind of smart home gelled into this where we're talking about um, smart hubs and smart plugs and you know, that's information that's really um, filling up the application. Um, so this is something that we're bringing to life in, in the next year or so, but it's really just that idea of sort of not dreaming super big, but dreaming of something we know is necessary, then suddenly having enough energy behind it to make it happen. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slightly cut this video short um, and just uh, talk to you about the very last project. And I talked about a lot of numbers. 
um, throughout this presentation. And I think the, the, the kind of moment we got to was, was a, a, a new company we were, we were working with, and um, it was about can we quantify the unquantifiable. Um, once you put numbers behind something, they sort of become more relevant and more tangible, and you can analyze them much more and definitely see how they relate to you. And so this was about kindness. How can we quantify kindness? How can we rebalance the world and introduce more kindness? We all read the newspaper, pick up the news, read Twitter and whatever else it might be, and see the amount of travesties and unkindness in the world. So why can't, as designers, we design a product and project to introduce more kindness into the world? So we were working with a company called uh, Change Our World for Good um, that Ravi kindly introduced us to. And um, we developed a platform that used the virtuous circle. So the virtuous circle is, if I am kind to somebody, I'm kind to me. So you feel good when you're kind to somebody. So this is about acts of random kindness, so ARC. Um, and so we developed this platform for ARC. And this was a, is a digital platform. It's an ecosystem again. And so a digital platform where you're filling your heart up. But you're not filling your heart up necessarily with fitness health, as again, you might expect from something like this, but you're filling it up with kindness. So a different type of feeling good. So as you go about your daily routine and you commit acts of ra random kindness, your heart fills up. And this will be available in the App Store next month. And, and Design in Darba, everybody here will have the first chance to be able to download it, along with another component that will be available. And it does a similar thing, so it tracks how kind you are over a given time. It creates a community of kindness. So it's really, you have this blog, you have this community, you have this feed that's about you know, really documenting how kind you are. And then it has a physical component to this. So it has a, a piece of hardware to make it tangible, make it tactile, put it in hand. Um, and this was a, the physical embodiment of this um, is the ark. And you might sort of we thought about this project and, you know, what's a, what's a little boat going to do? What's a little arc-shaped thing really going to achieve? But if you can say to people that you can fill this little arc and then you can give it to somebody else of your choosing, you're creating an open source charity. So you choose the individual you give it to. You choose the organization you give it to. You're empowered to make the choices where you're not necessarily dictated to by a single charity. But with this little vessel, this vessel for kindness, you're able to give it to whoever you want. You are able to commit an act of random kindness, fill this up with money, and then basically pass it on to somebody that needs it. So we have this increasing kindness with the digital platform, making you feel good about that, and then physically giving literally money to people, but having this little emblem of kindness on your desk or at home. And you sort of create this sea of kindness. And this is a, this is a product where the first generation of this uh, last year was, was almost half a million of these were produced, made in South Africa, by South Africans, given to South Africans. And I love that, that idea of keeping that as a really closed loop. And next year, after that half a million last year, the aim is to do a million this year. And to give you um, a sense of that, I think what we'd like to do is, I'd like to show you that in context. We talked about numbers and how you visualize numbers and, and how we can um, you know, make that a bit more tangible. And a million arcs, so if you imagine how many arcs that is, we've kind of got a little um, sort of display to show how many arcs that might be. And a million arcs is like a cool concept, and that was only two and a half thousand. So 400 times that, and I'm glad I'm not on stage to receive that as well. I was in a little bit of danger there. <laughs> but anyway, that's, it's about um, uh, spreading the wealth, making open source wealth, giving to who you want to. Um, but ultimately, what I wanted to, the message I wanted to talk about today was about um, uh, can, as a designer, you use a part of what you're good at to give back and maybe use design for a more powerful tool. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, thanks for your time. And enjoy the rest of the conference.